Hello, hello. Um, I am now uh, waiting for Dr. Camila Phillips to come join. As I've been promoting, we are going to be doing a Q&A with her, answering questions that you've had, uh, you've submitted about menopause and perimenopause. So um, if you don't mind bearing with me. Oh, I <laughs> hello, everyone that's coming to join. Uh, why not introduce her now? before she hops on so that you have we have more time to ask questions with her because we're going to be capped at 30 minutes since her uh, this is part of her um, non-work time so with dr. Phillips she is a board certified obstetrician certified obstetrician and gynecologist uh, she's also a NAMS certified menopause practitioner that's the North American Menopause Society practitioner educated in menopause and midlife health care issues I have my little cheat sheet. That's why I just keep looking. So, um, if you don't mind, bear hold having a little patience and waiting with me um, for her to hop on, and then we can ask questions. Hello, everyone joining. I'll let you know as we're waiting. The first question I'm going to ask her about is actually um, no one likes to talk about, but a dry vagina because in menopause and postmenopause, the vaginal lining gets super dry, and that's related to the drop in our hormones um, and it becomes so dry for some women it feels like sandpaper uh, I know a lot of people don't want to hear about that but this is just the truth and even when I um, posted that that was gonna be a question oh here here she comes hold on everyone hang on she's joining us hi hey. hi dr. Phillips hi. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Good. I actually, even though you weren't here, I gave your intro of all your credentials. Because <laughs> I was, I know we're capped at 30 minutes since this is, um, this is your family time. So I, you know, really appreciate you volunteering your Thank time. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm actually still stuck at work. So. Oh, you are. I forward to getting home to them but thank you for having me i'm going to set my timer just so because i i'm very uh respectful of your time because i know this is keeping you from then going home um <laughs> if you don't mind i'm going to go straight into the questions yeah, for everyone to hear it. all right so the first one i was mentioning is going to be about the dry vagina so a lot of women's vaginal lining gets extremely dry postmenopause, and it feels like sandpaper for some and it becomes also painful to have sex. So I was wondering what some of the options that you suggest to patients, and I know, you know, it depends per patient, that they can discuss with their gyno and my, that, and does that ever change? Yeah. So that's actually a great question. It's a really common question that I get. And one thing I try to, first of all, even as women are moving into perimenopause, menopause, it remind them is the vagina very much is a muscle. So it is one of those things where you kind of want to exercise it. And it doesn't have to be with someone, but you want to exercise it because that keeps blood flow moving to the vagina. It keeps the tissues healthy and engaged. So one thing um, is obviously sex, there's masturbation, those things are really helpful. But if you notice that you're starting to have issues, the first thing is I always tell people, and this is 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, use lubrication. There is no shame in lu using lubrication when it's necessary for intercourse. Um, I tend to recommend silicone-based lubricants because there's a little bit of a slip that lasts longer. If you're finding that lubrication isn't working, um, people use oils. Obviously, you have to not be allergic. You don't want to be using condoms because that can degrade the condom. But really getting to the big kahuna, it's estrogen. And the way I like to describe it is, and I love Ikea, shop there all the time, but it's the difference between like sleeping on a pillow top, you know, pat, what's it, surly, posturpedic, fabulous, you know, $2,000 mattress um, in your 20s, 30s, 40s. And as we enter menopause, because the estrogen is decreasing, it starts to get thinner and you're sleeping on like a thinner mattress. I call it like my Ikea mattress. Love them, but not <laughs> as comfortable as the high-end mattress. And so I really do recommend estrogen. Um, you have to talk to your doctor about it. Even patients 
who have a history of certain cancers can still use vaginal estrogen because there was a huge um, realization, especially by some oncologists, that vaginal discomfort, atrophy, dryness, whatever you want to call it, has a huge impact on someone's life. And so even a little bit of vaginal estrogen can make a huge difference in someone's quality of life. So I, I really love estrogen. Oh, I love, uh, thank you. Cause I think that was definitely um, something that not everyone knows about. The next question I have is uh, as a result of the Women's Health Initiative research from 2005, I think hormone therapy gets a bad rap in the, in the United States. Absolutely. Um, so if someone doesn't have previous family history or personal history of uh, breast cancer, um, what would you, oh, let me, for example, my old gyno, before I switched to you, had gave me a blanket statement when I asked about it. He just said, no, that causes cancer. Um, and I have no cancer uh, history, but he didn't even entertain it. And then I had someone submit a question saying, I'm curious about HRT. My OBGYN wouldn't entertain it, but my friends in Hong Kong are all on HRT for mood, hot flashes, bone density, skin elasticity. Uh, HRT seems like the course of treatment for menopause in Asia. So I wanted um, to hear when you feel like it's proper to prescribe and maybe what are the contraindications? Yeah. So definitely um, I was part of that group as a young physician uh, Women's Health Initiative came out and we were like, no, estrogen. It was a very clear message that was sent out across to trainees, medical students, residents, and even doctors. We don't like estrogen. Progesterone is horrible. Don't use it. Um, that data has since been reanalyzed. More studies have come behind it. And we were kind of misled and, you know, frankly, wrong on some of those initial very strong assertions about the negative side of estrogen. Now, look, anytime I start someone on estrogen, I tell them, you're going to read the side of the box and freak out. But because we're having this conversation, you're, you're a carefully selected patient. This is probably something that can enhance your life. Um, in terms of patient population, um, we want to think about someone who is having, in particular, hot flashes, mood disturbances, difficulty sleeping, because that's sort of a systemic effect of estrogen. If you come to me and you say your primary symptom that concerns you is vaginal dryness, then you might not need to be on systemic hormone replacement therapy. We can just do something in the vagina. Best candidates are also people who are newly entering uh, menopause. Uh, the WHI was really flawed in that the women who were having the most negative effects, those were women who were in their 70s, newly started on hormone replacement therapy, they shouldn't have been on hormone replacement therapy in the first place. And so if someone comes in, she's in her late 40s, early 50s, within, you know, seven to 10 years on the on, of onset, um, has great cardiovascular health, non-smoker, you know, is these are people that, you know, doesn't have any um, abnormal vaginal bleeding, no active hormonally responsive cancers, et cetera. You know, you would go over your list with your physician. These are women who are actually quite good candidates for hormone replacement therapy. The traditional thought process is that we start at the lowest dose for the shortest amount of time. But let me tell you, that's even changing because we're seeing that, um, it changes women's lives for the better. And so definitely I do see in other countries people who, again, I'm like, hmm, he or she would probably be off hormones, are still on hormones. They're thriving and they're doing well. And listen, I, I will say, um, I do have patients who are older um, on hormones uh, for various reasons. We monitor them carefully. They're regularly getting um, mammograms. And I have the recurrent conversation. This is about building relationships, having opus, open and honest conversations about what your risks are, and have informed decision making. I love it. Oh, that's very, that's so helpful. I love that you're part of the WHI. So you have like a different, you have both perspectives. Um, the next question is about 
I guess, food and hormones. Um, I'm going to read the two different <laughs> questions. That, that, that It's essentially the same, but two different people ask. One person wrote, I'd be curious to know if there are natural ways to maintain your progesterone estrogen levels once they start to taper off. And then a similar question is, do, let me see if I can, do phytoestrogenic foods have, have estrogenic-like effects or increase estrogen in the body? Yeah. So the answer, to, there's not a concrete answer for each individual person, I would say to that. I would say there are definitely um, herbal supplements, food supplements that have estrogen-like properties in the body, often weak estrogen um, activi uh, activity. Those are supplements that people use that, that are like black cohosh, soy, um, flaxseed, um, things like that. Um, those does, are it, does, it, does it help, I guess, in taking those? Does it help symptoms or is it, it's the black cohosh I've heard uh, in has, mm -hmm. yeah that helps but it how i guess my question is how much will it help or does that depend per person absolutely depends per person and so in walking someone through their approach if you will to starting hormone therapy typically what i do is they say you know i saw something at the drugstore it was this or my friend gave me a sample of black cohosh should i take it I go through it with them and I say, you know, it's not going to hurt you. We don't think this is going to hurt you. Let's um, manage our expectations as to how much this will help you, but let's try it. And so I want her to feel comfortable that she's worked through different options before going to hormone replacement therapy. So she knows if it, you know, she's gone through everything before she knows that it didn't work. Um, you've lost maybe a few bucks. Okay. But at least, you know, and then we can get to hormone replacement therapy. If you think it's right for you, listen, if a $10 supplement, even if it's placebo effect at the drugstore works with someone for someone, I'm happy. And I'm glad that they're getting the relief that they deserve. And if not, we quickly move on and we go to hormone replacement. Awesome. Oh, and I just want, uh, so this, I think, is something people don't like to talk about, but everyone wonders, like, so your sex drive mm -hmm. for a lot of women are greatly drops noticeably, mm -hmm. um, and it becomes worrisome because uh, it feels like, oh, it's not like how it was before, and there's mm -hmm. something wrong with me. So what are some options women can discuss with their gyno uh, in terms of what you can do about your libido? Yeah. And does it ever return to love? Does it, you know, how everything levels, does everything, any, does it ever level out? Yeah. <laughs> because the you know, if that's, I have patients at every age range, 50s, 60s and beyond, who actually have a really active sex life. And so I don't necessarily assume, <laughs> yeah, that it um, is an automatic. Um, a lot of people are, are very sexually active. Now, I will say this. And this is for the 20 year old and the 60 year old. Look, where's your biggest sexual organ? <laughs> right? For many people who identify as female, their biggest sexual organ is their brain. And so when someone comes in and they're like, my libido has tanked, it's, it's not just about a pill or a hormone or something to give you a quick fix. For us, it's a little bit more complicated and deserves to be teased out. It is, how's your job? Are your bills mm -hmm. paid? How's your partner? What was the last time you guys like connected? Uh, oh, your kids, are they still getting on your nerves? Like there are so many things that really in a woman's life layer on um, to impact the libido. We should not take for granted other medical conditions. So it's important that you get worked up. Um, just like male counterparts, hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, absolutely affects your libido and your thyroid. So we can't ignore those things. So after you've been worked up, um, I approach it from a few different ways. One, I try and get you to see a sex therapist because again, this is your sexual organ. And, um, once we know physically everything is okay, then we can start 
the additional supplementation or engagement of your body that we need. So getting people engaged with their body um, is important. I often ask them to visit one of a few of my adult stores that I really like. Just getting them to engage with themselves first. Uh, I think I mentioned this already, but secondarily is the sex therapist. So we can figure out what's going on in the person's mind, their relationship, their sense of themselves. And then if we need to, um, hormones are helpful. Now, we don't specifically start hormone replacement therapy to fix your libido. Again, it's much more complicated than that. But if you're having vaginal dryness, and it hurts when you have sex, you're gonna run from your partner. So we need to fix that. Um, I and some other OBGYNs are getting a little bit more comfortable with it, but the use of estrogen and testosterone in the pelvic floor has been helpful for a number of people. So that's something you can consider. There are also medications. Um, I don't wanna mention them by name, you gotta talk to your doctor about it but there's oral medications, also injectable, that can um, also help people with, uh, their, that's specifically targeted to libido. And again, guess where it works? In your brain. Um, so those are the things that I help uh, people sort of learn and understand. Thank you, thank you. Those are great, uh, great for people to think that. about. <laughs> um, and then the next question, it's two different people ask, it's really about weight gain. So, um, is weight gain postmenopause a given, uh, even if we have good uh, exercise and a good diet? And the second person had similar. So, like, I work out three times a week. I do cardio once a week. What else can I do? I eat salad every day for every single meal. So, I guess the ultimate thing is like, uh, what to do about the weight gain? That seems very common. Yeah. So, is it inevitable? I don't want to say that. I would say it's challenging as we get older. Again, also our male counterparts, everyone seems to gain a little bit of weight. The metabolism does change. You know, the ratio of like fat to muscle also changes. We're all um, a little bit more sedentary. One thing that I do encourage people to do, and this is, you know, 40s, and beyond is to pick up some weights. I think often women are very um, shy or hesitant to pick up weights because we don't want to bulk up, right? We don't want to look big. And um, I'd like us to have a paradigm shift about that. Muscles are actually quite sexy. They help you burn more calories, right? And as you know, with bone health, they're instrumental in keeping your bones strong and healthy. And so I also find it a way that we can help um, manage the weight gain uh, that can occur during menopause. Another thing is really encouraging people to go more plant-based because what you ate before, I mean, we saw this before menopause, right? But what you were able to eat in your 20s changes into your 30s, changes into your 40s. Um, we know that happens naturally. So some preventative measures uh, are really helpful to put in place. So pick up some weights, consider being plant-based. And um, those are the two big things that, I mean, there's obviously seeing weight loss specialists, nutritionists, all of that kind of thing also helps. Thank you. Um, I had someone ask, uh, none of her doctors had suggested a bone density scan and when should the scan be done or, or is there, are there particular types of people who should have, should have it done more so than others? Yeah. So, um, that's interesting. If you're postmenopausal, I mean like the latest we're getting bone uh, earliest, latest, depending on how you look at it, um, is age 65, but that number really should change if you have risk factors and risk factors can be anything from you know, your diet, um, a history of medications that affects or impact the bone, uh, being Asian, white, having a family history of osteoporosis, having a weird like fracture, um, you should get a bone scan. So I would, you know, have whenever patients come in and they're like, I want this test. And in my head, I'm like, why should I want that test? <laughs> you know, instead of having such a negative, like visceral reaction, like, why do you want the test? What do you think that it will uh, do for you? How do you think it will contribute to your health? And so we have a conversation about it. Um, 
And I explain to them, you know, we go back and forth, I explain to them how it should or could benefit them. But definitely, if you are having risk factors, and if your postmenopausal a bone density is um, an entirely reasonable uh, evaluation. Got it. Um, I had someone ask about incontinence. Uh, I had to deal with incontinence lately. Can that be menopause related, even if I've never had a child? Potentially, potentially. Um, incontinence, uh, there are a few different types, but most importantly, uh, stress incontinence is when you laugh, sneeze, cough, run, those kind of things. Some people have the type of incontinence where you just, you think about a bathroom and you're like, where, you see the handle of the door and you just can't get there. Um, and some people have a combination that's a little mixed. So it really depends on you as an individual. Um, incontinence can be made worse by just simply being overweight. It doesn't necessarily have to be menopause. If, for example, you're an asthmatic and you have a chronic cough, that constant pressure on your pelvis can contribute to stress incontinence. Um, and menopause, in a way, also can because, again, the pelvic floor is one of the most underappreciated um, muscle groups. just on menopause alone, but I would also do a global sort of assessment of what your risks are for incontinence. Okay. Um, and depression. Uh, how does one decipher whether symptoms of depression are something, whether it's menopause related or not menopause related? Um, and should it be treated the same, whether regardless of the, the reasons? Yeah, that one, uh, that's a little tricky um, because symptoms can often overlap. Um, but typically with menopause, um, they, I would say they can like wax and wane a little bit more and not be so constant. Um, and it also depends on the types of depression um, that people are experiencing, whether it's like situational, if it's mixed with anxiety and other things. And so when you ask if they should be treated the same, I would say my answer is probably not. That is something that um, I would see a psychologist, psychiatrist about because we do use um, SSRIs, which is a class of medicine that's helpful for depression and anxiety in menopause medicine, but it's also, but it overlaps to sort of treat um, Thi not thyroid, sorry, um, hot flash issues it can help with sleep, can help with anxiety. But if you're having a true depression, you might, one, need a higher dose. You might need a different class of medications. So I would really encourage that person to get um, a closer evaluation to make sure they're getting the right treatment and not assume that it's the same thing. Okay. Um, and I had some similar to, I guess, what do you do if you get UTIs in perimenopause? Like, um, is that, I didn't even know that was common uh, that got that as a, as a question. Is, is that common, UTIs during perimenopause, menopause? Yeah, so, I mean, UTIs happen to, uh, you know, at every age, but basically it's a urinary tract infection for those who aren't familiar with that term. Um, UTIs can happen with a little bit more frequency. And one of the reasons is, is because our, our anatomy is so close to each other, right? Um, that is one thing that can cause UTIs to be more efficiently spread. And two, also the lack of estrogen in the vagina makes it easier for some people to get uh, urinary tract infections. So um, it is one reason uh, also that my older patients, 60s, 70s, beyond, who maybe don't have a ton of symptoms, but for example, are getting recurrent UTIs, one of the methods, you know, and I would approach it slightly different from a urologist, we work in conjunction with each other, but vaginal estrogen can help with recurrent UTIs. Oh, that's great to, that's great to know. Um, and I, I'll have you uh, answer this one. I, I mean, I think I knew the answer to this one, but are, uh, so are yoga and HIT considered strengthening exercises, bone building? And are bone building and strengthening the same thing? <laughs> That's your department. Yeah, um, so are yoga and HIT strength building? Yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, to me, I would think so. I think it also depends on the type of yoga, right? Some yoga is very athletic and 
um, yogis are super strong people. They just develop their muscle groups in like a different way, but they're extremely strong. So to me, it would, I would consider it strength building. I think it's different when you're approaching it from bone health, um, like a high intensity activity is probably a little bit better for bone health um, in terms of like the banging of the bones, but those are both really great activities and workouts. Okay, great. What do you Thank think? you. <laughs> I agreed with you. I, I was thinking the same thing. Yoga, great for exercise, but not necessarily for um, the, for bone impact. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but if that's what makes you happy, then you should be then sticking with yoga. You should do it. I think one thing I would probably add going back to the inevitable weight loss question is just, it's about consistency. And I think all of us struggle with consistency and just showing up to your workout. So if one day you feel like you want to do a yoga and the next day it's hit, girlfriend, just show up. You are <laughs> ahead of the game and doing better than most of us are. I love it. Um, we're almost done because I also, I got about five minutes and then, you, okay. then you're going to go home. Um, I had a question about, we know that menopause affects bone density. Does it affect teeth? I had someone asking saying she feels like even though she takes plenty of calcium, but that she feels like it affects her teeth. I don't know if that's a thing. I think it's more like age related. It can definitely be age related um, okay. because again, just our male counterparts also suffer from teeth issues as well. Um, I would encourage everyone. I mean, I'm guilty of it too, to regularly see their dentist, have regular cleaning, really watch for, um, their gum disease and that kind of thing, you should take estrogen, not sorry, you should take a calcium vitamin D supplement. Absolutely. Because that's also often somewhere where nutritionally we're deficient and those needs are increased in the perimenopause, postmenopause area. But I often see that just across the board with people aging. Okay. Thank you. And then, um, you kind of answered it before, but I'm just going to, but I think it's helpful. People always want to know the natural, what are the natural herb supplements that have evidence-based research behind them that help women, their symptoms? And I know you listed them, but yeah. I will kind of end with that for people to, you know, just remember. Yeah. So, you know, I use the term evidence-based a little loosely because you can always find a study to prove your point, right? So I just And nutrition to too. Yeah, I feel like for everything. <laughs> for everything, right? Um, so I just want to put that out there. So I consider it when patients ask me that, things that are more anecdotal, cultural, that people use to help specifically with like hot flashes and moodiness that they might experience. So the big ones are like evening primrose, black cohosh, um, an increase uh, in soy, uh, in their diet. Um, sometimes people use flaxseed. Those are things that, okay. again, have a really low chance of hurting you. So if it's something that you want to try and experiment with, I don't see, um, you know, always obviously check with your physician that you should have a problem with, but things to consider. But the term evidence base is a little strong. So okay. <laughs> like, exactly put that out there. Fantastic. I am going to, uh, my last question is uh, mm -hmm. to let everyone know, because not everyone is, it, it can find, knows how to find the, a gynecologist who has menopause yeah. education. Yeah. So I found you through menopause.org. Yeah. And I'm curious for you, if you're looking for a gyno, what are things that you're looking for, especially if you're around that age, you know, in your late forties, early fifties and going through perimenopause, like what would you want in your what gynecologist? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I look for doctors who aren't afraid to like answer awkward questions and don't shy away from tough conversations because very honestly, when we're talking about menopause, what follows? It's emotional stuff. It's sex stuff. It's relationship stuff. And so when I'm looking for a physician, it would be someone who doesn't shy away from like those weird, awkward conversations, because that's sort of how we build a relationship is having <laughs> those uncomfortable conversations. And Makes sense. Who is like honest about what their level of experience is. And so if they're like, hmm, I don't have the answer because I don't have the answers to everything. I say, but I can find out for you or we can do some research together. So, so in essence, someone who's willing to like 
explore, learn, and have conversations and go on this journey with you. Um, you know, all of us have been training for a really long time. Information changes pretty quickly. And so it's hard for everyone to keep up with everything. But if you find someone who's willing to have, at least have the conversation, because as you mentioned, some of your followers just totally get shut down, not appropriate. Um, yeah. That's the important thing that they're able to have those awkward conversations, try and find you the answers if you don't have the answers, and then can give you resources. Thank you so much for your time. I this is you volunteered your time to answer all these questions. Um, and then for everyone trying to uh, looking for you, it's Dr. Camila says you can see it on here. Yeah, and have a, a wonderful evening with the family. Thank you. I'm gonna go. <laughs> Hi, baby. So nice to see you. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>